the Bible is open. Father, I am always so grateful for the opportunity we have to look at your word, that you would teach us that these things that were written literally thousands of years ago, Lord, are uh, not just ancient history, but Lord, there are your words speaking to us even today. And uh, we have that promise because it's through Jesus. And so, Lord, we pray that you would teach us by your spirit. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So sometimes we ask, you know, if you want the good news or the bad news. Other times we ask, you know, um, you know what do you think about uh, the opportunities that you get in life? What's worse, never having an opportunity or getting an opportunity and then just wasting it, letting it go by? On one hand, you know, you think those who never get the opportunity, they never know what they're missing. Ah, so maybe that's not so bad. On the other hand, if we're given the opportunity, at least we have a chance to experience the blessing of that thing, even if we fail at it. Now, whatever philosophical position you take on, it seems God's preference is to give the opportunity. God wants us to have opportunities, even if those opportunities are wasted. He gives us, at the very least, the opportunity to know Him, to know His power, to know His grace. Even if He knows that's an opportunity we're going to pass by, He's going to give us that opportunity. And that's why Jesus is given to all the world, of course, so all the world might be saved, even though all the world does not believe. He gives us the opportunity. And we see this throughout the Bible. We, in fact, you can see it as far back as the very first family in human history. Adam and Eve, they were given the choice and the chance not to sin, but to rely on God's blessing and provision. Cain, of course, God approached him and let him know, warned him about the, the sin that was approaching him. He was given the opportunity not to murder his brother Abel, but to find his satisfaction in God. Now, both that first generation and second generation, they wasted their initial opportunities, just as God knew that they would, but God still gave them the chance. Well, God gives us opportunities as well. He wants us to walk in His blessing, to walk in close fellowship with Him. He even gives us what we need to do that, of course, through the sacrifice of His Son, Jesus' resurrection from the dead, and the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. And, of course, God still knows our weaknesses, and God knows our failings. And despite those weaknesses and failings, his desire for us is to succeed, and so he gives us a chance to do it. God gave the same chance to Israel, and that's evident in Deuteronomy chapter 31. Now, God was giving them all the provision they needed. He told them the purpose for which they would need it, but he also knew prophetically that they would fail. That was a foregone conclusion, but God gave them the opportunity anyway. This, guys, this is the grace of God that we're going to see here. This is his love for his people. No, he doesn't want us to fail. Yes, he knows we will fail, but God also knows our future beyond our failings. God knows what he will do in us and through us through Christ Jesus. So yes, he continues to give us opportunities to follow him that we might understand that we are constantly and utterly dependent on his grace. So we start in these first few verses, in just verses 1 through 8, this is where the nation's going to be commissioned, but here we see God's promise for Israel. We might say God's provision for Israel. Verses 1 and 2, Then Moses went and spoke these words to all Israel, and he said to them, I am 120 years old today. I can no longer go in, excuse me, I can no longer go out and come in. And the Lord has said to me, you shall not cross over this Jordan. Now, at this point, the book of Deuteronomy is transitioning towards its conclusion. The main portion of the book is done. The law has been fully instructed to the nation. All, uh, we also saw its incentives to keep the law through the blessings and the curses. And wrapping it up, we saw last time that Israel was given the choice to follow through or not. You're given the choice of life or death. They could obey the Lord and live, or they could fish, forsake the Lord and be destroyed. Moses implored the people, as you can see at the end of chapter 30, to choose life. And with that imploring to choose life, the formalities of the covenant are completed. Obviously, the book's not done yet. We've got several more chapters, right? And that's because Moses' life is not yet ended. Deuteronomy is not only the final of the five books of uh, Moses, but it's the finality of Moses' own life, what we see here. His swan song is yet to be written, and that's the basic overall subject, really, of chapters 31 through 34, the end of the book. It begins with Moses acknowledging that his days on earth are almost done. Now, we've got to understand that at this point, the prophet's not just a senior citizen, but he's a senior citizen's senior citizen. You know, 120 years old, he almost qualifies for Social Security twice. Now, skeptics have long doubted Moses' age, but when we consider God's sovereign plan for Moses... To use Moses in the development of Israel, it shouldn't seem at all unusual that Moses lived to such an old age. 
And we remember in Genesis, and even you don't even have to go back to the earliest chapters in Genesis, but you know, Joseph, who is the son of Jacob, the prime minister of Egypt, Joseph died at age 110. His father Jacob was 130 when he first went to Egypt and talked to Pharaoh, and he didn't die until the age of you know, 147. Uh, remember, Moses is just a handful of generations separated from these guys, just a, you know, 400 years, handful of generations, and he had the blessing of God, so no surprise that he lived to the age he did. Interestingly, we can't separate and divide Moses' life into three 40-year segments. The first 40 years, Moses lived as a man of wealth and influence in the house of Pharaoh. The next 40 years, he lived in the shadow of Mount Sinai, living humbly as a shepherd. And the final 40 years, he still lived as a shepherd, but as a shepherd of God's people as he humbly served the Lord. Most of us, of course, our lives start slowing down at age 60. Moses started his ministry career at age 80. God can do some incredible things for us no matter what age we may be. Now, as much as Moses did and could do, the one thing you notice here that he's not allowed to do is to cross over the Jordan River. And we remember the reason why he had not, of course, rebelled with the rest of the nation at Kadesh Barnea when they refused to enter the Promised Land, but God still uh, judged Moses for his own sin against Moses in his own way. Remember, Moses was fed up with the complaints of the people. He misrepresented God before them. He acted in anger when God was not yet angry with the people. Moses struck a rock twice to bring water forth from the rock. He said, must we bring water forth from this rock? He just misrepresented God uh, in Numbers chapter 20. Now, as God's prophet, God's mediator to the people, he had a sacred responsibility to represent God rightly, and he failed. Now, God's merciful on Moses. He allowed him to live to this point, but he does not allow him to physically enter the promised land. All right, so you put it together, being that Moses is now 120 years old, he's seen that he's finished teaching the Torah law, well, the writing's on the wall. His death would be coming soon, transition would need to take place, and that's transition, that's what he instructs here, starting in verses 3 and following. The Lord your God himself crosses over before you. He will destroy these nations from before you, and you shall dispossess them. Joshua himself crosses over before you, just as the Lord has said. And the Lord will do to them as he did to Sihon and Og, kings of the Amorites, and their land when he destroyed them. The Lord will give them over to you that you may do to them according to every commandment which I have commanded you. Now, Moses, notice, will not cross over the Jordan, but who would? God. Moses doesn't cross over. God does. Just because Israel's prophets are disciplined by God doesn't mean the rest of the nation is going to be punished as well. Now, later on, the nation is going to bear its own punishment for its own sin, but that's later. For now, God's going to personally bring Israel over to the land according to his promise. Yahweh God is going to act on Israel's behalf. And three actions are shown here. Act number one is God's going to provide a new leader in Joshua. We see that in verse 3. One prophet would die, another's raised, and Israel could hardly have asked for a better successor. Remember, Joshua had served as Moses' disciple and assistant for decades. goes back to their earliest days after leaving Egypt. Joshua had been with Moses on Mount Sinai when God originally uh, gave the covenant at that time. And Joshua had been privy to some of Moses' most personal times with the Lord. So if anyone's prepared to pick up where Moses left off, it's Joshua. By the way, Joshua is the name for Jesus, by the way. We say Jesus, but that's a Greek translation of the Hebrew name, which is in English, Joshua. It means Yahweh is salvation, or could be translated Yahweh saves, but it's a perfect name for our Savior, our Jesus, right? Joshua. So the act number one is to provide a, a leader. Act number two, God's going to provide victory over the enemies. We see that in verse four. The initial adult generation coming out of Egypt, of course, had died, right? They died in the wilderness. Their children are grown during the wilderness wanderings. And those children had, as they grew, took part in several battles. That's when they acquired the lands east of the Jordan, north of Moab, where Sihon and Og reigned in their lands. And just like God did to those kings, God promised to do to the kings over the Jordan. Israel could rely on this knowledge. They had seen God work in the past. They could trust God would work in the future. That's the second act. Act number three, God's going to provide deliverance to the nation. We see that in verse 5. Now, this seems very similar to this promised military victory in verse 4, but there is a, a little bit of a distinction. Notice in verse 4, Yahweh fights the battle for Israel. In verse 5, Yahweh delivers the kings to Israel. What we see there is it's not a temporary, one-time military victory that God gives. It's the total conquering and the delivering of His land to His people that Israel may dwell permanently 
and the land. So God's going to act in mighty ways when he takes them over. With God doing all that on Israel's behalf, Moses can give the people now this wonderful exhortation and promise in verse 6. Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them, for the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong. Be without fear. Don't back down. Don't shrink into unbelief and unfaithfulness. Right? They'd come too far to turn back now. Forty years earlier, their fathers and grandfathers had turned back. They balked on the edge of the promised land. They heard the reports of giants being in the land. They feared, they feared the, the earthly giants more than the infinite God. This time, things needed to be different. Moses pleaded with the people, don't make the same mistakes. Here, now stand strong. Stand in faith. Move forward with the Lord God in power. Why? Well, because we already saw it, but it's repeated here. Yahweh God would be with them. Moses is leaving them, but God is going to remain with the nation in major ways. And just as surely as God's tent, his tabernacle, remained at the center of Israel's camp, so his presence would remain with the nation itself. God is not going to you know, leave his people alone on the brink of their next stage of their history. He's going to give them victory just as he promised. Be strong and be courageous. And beloved, we need to be strong and courageous. The things God has promised us, God is going to fulfill. There is nothing in this world that we need fear. Not coronaviruses, not layoffs, not riots in the street, not political upheavals, not cultural revolutions, none of those things. You know, to listen to the media, you'd think they would want us to fear. You know, so we can just cling to our political leaders on either side of the aisle. It doesn't matter. They just want us to fear. So we cling to politics. But when we cling to Almighty God through the Lord Jesus Christ, we have no reason to fear. Now, sickness is going to come, maybe. When people fight, maybe. We hope it doesn't come to that. We pray for peace. We pray for sanity. But fear, we have no reason. We serve the Almighty God. He has us in the palm of His hand. So we can be strong and courageous. Walk in faith, not fear. Walk in wisdom, in prayer, in supplication, in intercession. But never walk in fear. We may walk through trials, but when we walk with Christ, we never walk with those things alone. Our God is with us. And he will never leave us nor forsake us. Now what God told Mo, uh, Israel, excuse me, what Moses told Israel through God, Moses told Joshua specifically, look at verse 7 and following, the, Moses called Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and of good courage, for you must go with this people to the land which the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, he is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear nor be dismayed. So Joshua is the tool or the instrument to be used by God. God's the one to take the nation of the land. We already saw that. God's going to do that personally. He's going to be, defeat the enemy kings. God's going to deliver these nations over to Israel. But God still uses a human leader to do it, right? Joshua is a man. He's just a tool in the hands of God. And that is a blessing, right? To be an instrument in the hands of the master, why wouldn't we want to do that? Let him use us as his tool. I don't need to be seen for anything. You don't need to be seen for anything. We want Jesus to be known. So he uses us as his tool. He did that with Joshua. And you might notice that the, the, Moses repeats this promise to uh, Joshua that he gave earlier to Israel. This time he's repeating it to Joshua individually. Just like the nation need not fear, Joshua need not fear. God was with him too. God would give Joshua the strength and the wisdom needed to lead the nation according to God's will. And just as God's presence among Israel meant they didn't need to fear, it's the same way with Joshua. God would be with Joshua individually. And I love this because we know this is our promise. God is not just with His church, which He is, praise the Lord, but He is with us and in us individually. Our individual bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God is really with us. So again, why should we fear? We should never fear. So in these first eight verses, God gives His people a wonderful promise. He would go with them. He would be with them as they entered the land. He'd give them everything they needed to occupy the land. Once they got there, this is a wonderful opportunity. They're being given this new home, and they're not being given this all by themselves. They're not going into this land alone. The God who'd been with them in the wilderness will cross over with them into 
the, the land as they conquered these nations. God would be with them as they settled into their new home. They had this opportunity to be in constant fellowship with God. Okay, you see where we're going with this because we have the same opportunity, right? We can spend every day in constant fellowship with our Lord Jesus. We can live every day filled with the Spirit, guided by His Scriptures, following after Christ. We can do it. We just don't often follow through. But we know the opportunity exists, so we need to seize that opportunity every day. So you've got this promise, but along with the promise is a method to be reminded of the promise through the written law. So we see in verses 9 through 13 where the law is remembered. And as the law is remembered, here's where we see God's purpose. God's purpose for Israel. Verse 9, So Moses wrote this law and delivered it to the priests, the sons of Levi, who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and to all the elders of Israel. Now, you might notice that Moses wrote the law. If there is any question that Moses is the author of Deuteronomy, if not Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers as well, this should put it to rest. It says very clearly Moses wrote it, right? But practically speaking, Moses wrote the law and then handed it off. These aren't his personal memoirs for him to keep and just pass down through the family generations. It's not reserved only for the tribe of Levi. It's given to the whole nation, even pointed out to all the elders of Israel, through the safeguarding, of course, of the priests, but given to everybody. This was God's word to the nation, and it belonged to all the people of Israel. We can say exactly the same thing about the rest of Scripture. It belongs to all the people of God. It is not reserved for a special priestly caste. We, we understand, perhaps, that for 1,500 years following Jesus' resurrection, the Bible was kept out of the hands of the common people. It was reserved in language that few people understood, including only a small percentage of the priests, by the way. They didn't even understand the, the language that they were reading. And it was said in general, the Bible was, to be too difficult for the average person to understand. But what do we see here in Deuteronomy? That was never God's intent for His people in either the Old Testament or the New Testament. God wanted all of His people to know and to understand all of His Word because it is His Word that makes us complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work, 2 Timothy 3.17. So since we have this gift, one, by the way, for which men and women bled and died, let us use it. Read the Word. Read all of God's Word. Don't reserve your Bible time for just a few catchy phrases and promises. Read it all, asking God's help along the way. So it belonged to the nation, and we do see very specifically, by the way, it was to be read to the nation, verse 10, and Moses commanded them, saying, at the end of every seven years, at the appointed time in the year of release, at the Feast of Tabernacles, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses, you shall read this law before all Israel in their hearing. So when it's read, it's read during the seventh year. This is the Jubilee or the Shemitah, if you're familiar with that term. It's the, the same year that people are released from their financial debts. Well, that's the year people are going to be refreshed in God's word, potentially releasing them from spiritual burdens. And when we consider the times, of course, long before the printing press, only a, a few copies of God's written word would have existed at the time. We have multiple Bibles in our homes, most of us. Uh, they had very, very few Torah scrolls and in, in individual families, of course. With that in mind, imagine the joy it would have been to have the word of God presented to you. Sure, you would have heard bits and pieces as, as it's shared throughout the year at your Sabbath worship, there were a lot of scriptures that most Jews had memorized, but to hear it all, well, that's a seventh-year celebration, isn't it? And how's it read? Well, during this national convocation at the, the tabernacle, all Israel is to gather, as described later on in verse 12, as having every human being around within the boundaries of Israel, right? All of them are to leave their homes, to travel to the tabernacle, and the, the priest would read this law before all Israel in their hearing, is what is written here. Some have objected, say, well, you know, well, it's too far to travel, you know, and too many people. Not necessarily. We saw national convocations all the time with various feasts. Others have objected, saying, well, you know, that's too much to read to all the people at one time. Again, not likely. You know, um, it's doubtful that all five books of Moses were read, but probably just the book of Deuteronomy. And if it's just the book of Deuteronomy, well, that's a task that can be completed in less than three hours if you read it at a slow pace. 
In fact, there's one, at least one recorded instance in Scripture of this taking place when the people returned from Babylonian captivity. They uh, uh, gathered in Jerusalem, and Ezra the scribe read to them from the law, Nehemiah chapter 8, and it was explained to them. It was made known in their hearings. And that took place from morning till midday. The people paid attention all the way through. Now, your average movie today lasts anywhere between two to three hours at a time. And we can do that, surely, then we can listen to the proclamation of God's Word. Just a matter of willingness priorities. Okay, so why is it red? Well, here's where we get the purpose in verse 12. Gather the people together, men and women, your little ones, a stranger who's within your gates, that they may hear and that they may learn to fear the Lord your God and carefully observe all the words of this law, and that their children who have not known it may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land which you cross over the Jordan to possess. Threefold purpose for this reading, one, of course, to hear, but In that, to hear and to learn to fear the Lord your God, number one. Second, to learn to obey God and carefully observe the law. Third is to teach their children to do the same. Now, to learn to fear the Lord, that is essential. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, Proverbs 9, verse 10. Without the fear of the Lord, without the righteous reverence for the holiness of God and the respect for His person, without that, then we have no motive to worship Him or to walk with Him. Why worship a God who's just another guy? Why worship a God who's no more worthy than you or me? And when we downgrade the holiness of God, we lose our reverent fear of God, and we lose our worship of God. So we need to fear the Lord. On the second point, to carefully observe the law, that's also necessary. Obviously, a a perfect obedience is impossible. That's why we rely on Jesus' grace. He gets us through. But to disregard any need for obedience, well, that's foolish. To discount God's word as worthy of obedience is to not fear the Lord as God, is to not love the Lord as God. Jesus told his disciples that if you love me, you will keep my commandments. John chapter 14, verse 15. Now, certainly we need his power and his grace to keep them, but we should keep them. And then third, to teach our children is to pass on our love for the Lord to the next generation. We've seen elsewhere in Deuteronomy where Hebrew homes would raise up their children in the admonition of the Lord. Well, Christian homes should do likewise. It starts by modeling a sincere love for God, accompanied hopefully by loving instruction in God's Word. So this is this wonderful purpose of God's gift of the law to Israel, that they would fear and obey the Lord as God. And this is exactly what they needed in this opportunity that God was leading them in, right? Because how would they know what to do day to day in the new land that God was taking them to? Well, they needed God's instructions. They needed God's commands for them. The better they knew God's word, the more they would hide his word in their heart and not sin against him. Psalm 119, verse 11. We need the instruction of God's word. The Bible, of course, is far more than a how-to manual of the Christian life, but it does tell us what God expects from us in our Christian life. And more than that, it continually points us to our Jesus who empowers us to live this Christian life. Not a handbook so much as it is a guidebook taking us to Christ. So you've got God's promise and His purpose given to the people. Even so, God knew what lay ahead for the people's failure, and this is where they predict the future through the, the rest of the chapter. And we said first was God's promise and then God's purpose. This is God's prophecy over Israel. God's prophecy. Starting in verse 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, the days approach when you must die. Call Joshua and present yourself in the tabernacle of meeting that I may inaugurate him. So Moses and Joshua went and presented themselves at the tabernacle of meeting. Now, remember, Moses had known this instinctively back in verses 1 and 2. Now he's told it specifically by the Lord. Time had come for his death. Torch is going to be passed on to Joshua. So he's going to get inaugurated. What's inauguration? Uh, we use the term every four years with election cycles for our presidents. A little different with Israel. Joshua is not elected by the people. He's not sworn in in the same way our public officials are. Uh, in fact, our inaugurations are very, very public ceremonies. This is a semi-private ceremony. You've got Joshua, Moses, and the Lord of the Tabernacle. Now, obviously... People who are immediately around knows what's going on, the elders and the priests outside, but still just two men inside the tabernacle with the Lord. So this is you know, a semi-private thing. It's a holy commissioning. It's a solemn charge from God to Joshua. This is his formal call to ministry. We don't really have a firm parallel to this in our New Testament churches. Some might think of ordination. 
those who are ordained to ministry are generally ordained in a public setting, not a private setting like this. But the call, well, that spiritual call takes place privately between a man and God. God calls a man to pastoral ministry. God alone does that. It's ordination, what that is. That's just a public recognition of that call. It's when the church recognizes and affirms what God's already done. One other potential parallel is when we think of our chief prophet, Jesus. His call and his inauguration took place when? Really took place before the foundations of the earth is when it took place. Now, he's publicly ordained at his baptism by John, but his call to ministry predated the need for ministry because the Bible tells us Jesus was slain before the foundations of the world. God always knew his plan for Jesus. God gave his son before he ever even created man which always tells me how much He loves us, that He would still bother to create us, knowing what we would do in our sin. So Moses and Joshua, they go to the tabernacle. God shows up in a major way in verse 15. The Lord appeared at the tabernacle in a pillar of cloud, and the pillar of cloud stood above the door of the tabernacle. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, you will rest with your fathers, and the people will rise and play the harlot with the gods of the foreigners of the land where they go to be among them, and they will forsake me and break my covenant which I have made with them. So when God showed up at the tabernacle, He shows up in this glorious appearance. The technical word for this is a theophany, an appearance of God. And He does so not in a, a, a human form. That would be, of course, Christ is the image of the invisible God. He comes in human form incarnate. This is just a pillar of cloud, but this is the cloud of God's glory that had led Israel through the desert. Well, this same cloud fully descended above the door of the tabernacle. At this point, again, it's a semi-private ceremony, but there's no doubt in the minds of the people what's going on, because although you know they can't hear inside the tabernacle to hear what's going on, they see this cloud descend, and they saw this pillar, and they know without a doubt that is God in there with Moses and Joshua. So they saw all this taking place. Now, along with the theophany comes this sober prophecy. You've got God's joy over Joshua calling him to the ministry there. But God also knew what would take place in the generations after Joshua, how the people would fall, fall away. And he describes this tragic, tragic picture and a contrast as Moses is laying down in the grave, laying down in his bed of rest. The people rise up in sin. Moses would die, but the idolatrous desire of Israel rises up like a zombie, bringing out the worst of people, just like our sinful nature so often do. We reckon our sinful desires dead, but they rise up at the most inopportune times, which is one more reason we need to always rely on Jesus, because we've got nothing of ourselves. And you might notice the way God describes it here, just awful. This future failure of Israel is worse than what we typically think of in our normal experiences. This failure was total. He doesn't describe a temporary slip up. He doesn't describe a sudden stumbling. And often that's what our sin is. A lot of times it is. It grieves us when we sin, but it grieves us immediately. Our consciences are struck by the things we've done. We quickly confess our sins. We ask for forgiveness. We receive it by the grace and the promise of of Christ, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, of course, He's faithful and just forgive us. That's not what God describes here for Israel. Here God describes total apostasy. He says, they will forsake me, meaning they will utterly abandon God. They would reject God, they would break the covenant, they'd forsake the God who had brought them to this place of blessing. How tragic it is when a once professing Christian now rejects Jesus. I think we've all had examples in our lives where we've seen people that do that. How sad it is when a person has fallen into true apostasy. And whenever it happens, the question usually becomes, you know, were they ever saved? Were they ever saved? It's hard to know. Scripture gives us at least one indication, and a lot of times that they were not, because John wrote that the apostates went out from among us, but they were not of us. The fact that they went out showed that they were not of us, basically, 1 John 2.19. But, you know, usually when we ask that question, although that's a question we ask verbally, that's not the one we're really asking. What we're really asking is, can this happen to me? I see it happen to them. Can it happen to me? Here is the answer. Not as long as you abide in Jesus. Our eternal security is not tied to our past prayer of salvation, 
It is not tied to a future potential failing. Our assurance of salvation, our eternal security is tied to faith in Christ alone for the forgiveness of sin. Someone who trusts Jesus for salvation is safe, not because of the ability of that person to walk obediently with Christ or a lack of ability thereof, but because of Jesus' finished work at the cross and the resurrection. And when we see examples of people who have fallen into apostasy, whatever it is that we might imagine about their past, whatever it is we might dream about their future, we don't know that much. We know this much for certain. Right now, at that moment, they are not trusting Christ. So you can't give that person assurance at that moment. We don't know what happened in the past or in the future. Will they in the future? Perhaps we pray that they might. But at that moment, you know what they need? They don't need the promise of assurance. They need the fear of the Lord. They need repentance. Because assurance is given to those who are abiding in Christ. The key for us in our walk is to abide in Jesus. We stay focused on Him. We trust Him. We don't look for, oh, I hope I can sin as much as I can with impunity and still be saved. Nor, on the other extreme, we don't need to fear the loss of our salvation every time we slip up. What do we do? We just stay in Jesus. He is powerful enough to keep those who trust Him. And He alone is where our assurance is found. Okay, so... They were not, right? They were forsaking him. What would God do to the people who forsook him? Well, he would forsake them, verse 17. Then my anger shall be aroused against them in that day, and I will forsake them, and I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured. And many evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, Have not these evils come upon us, because our God is not among us. I will surely hide my face in that day, because of all the evil which they have done, and that they have turned to other gods. Now let's address the question here. We might ask, is this a contradiction with God's earlier promise? In verses 6 through 8 of chapter 31, God states twice how he will not forsake his people. In verse 17, God says he would. Is this a contradiction? No, because we cannot remove this statement from the context of the covenant. Per Israel's covenant with God, this is exactly what God promised to do when and if they abandoned their worship of Him. Remember back in chapter 28, it is clear that God would bless them immensely if they obeyed, but God would curse them fiercely if they did not. If the people abandoned God, then God would abandon His protection of them. That does not contradict His promise because it is part of His promise. That's what goes with it. Additionally, we also need to look to the context of the earlier promise of God not forsaking His people in this chapter. Well, what was that in reference to? Specifically, it's in reference to the conquest, the conquest of the land. When Joshua led the nation across the Jordan into the land, God promised them victory and to be with them in their victory. And that, we know, is exactly what happened. The testimony of the book of Joshua is going to show us that God was always with His people throughout all their conquests, It was only by God's power that the land was delivered into the hands of the 12 tribes. Now, after that period, after Joshua, during the period of the judges, that's when the people started to abandon the Lord, and that's when God's protection started leaving them. So no, there's no contradiction. There's a solid principle here. What's the principle? We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. But without Christ, we can do nothing. Without God, His people are helpless. It was God who conquered the kings of the land, not Israel. It was God who protected the nation from attack, not Israel. If Israel decided that they could do without God, then they would do it without His protection and without His blessing. They would be helpless and they would be left alone. Again, guys, where is our hope? Where is our help? It is in Christ alone. It is not in us. This is why we cling so closely to Him, because He is our everything. He is our strong tower. He is our help. Verse 19, Now therefore, write down this song for yourselves and teach it to the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths, that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. When I brought them to the land flowing with milk and honey, of which I swore to their fathers, and they've eaten and filled themselves and grown fat, then they will turn to their other gods and serve them, and they will provoke me and break my covenant. 
Typically, we think of songs commemorating good and joyful things. Although there's the blues, but typically we don't sing the blues about the nation. We've got patriotic songs like America the Beautiful, Hopeful Thoughts for the Future. That's not the purpose of this particular national song of Israel. Unlike a lot of the psalms in the Bible, which are songs, this song is not a personal song of praise. It's not even a song of lament that seeks God's power. This is going to be a song of witness, God says, a testimony against Israel. When the nation did eventually delve into their sin and apostasy, when they got there and they started experiencing the consequences, God wanted this particular song to start ringing around in their minds. Oh yeah, God said this was going to happen. They start singing this song in their mind and remember exactly what God had prophesied. And notice what would set it off. It would be their provocation of God. By bringing them into the land, God had done so much for His people. He would have blessed them in tremendous ways, even far beyond what He had done in delivering them out of Egyptian slavery, far beyond what He did in providing for them 40 years in the wilderness. God would have finally given them a home, driven out these nations from before them, planted in this fruitful land flowing with milk and honey. And their response... Well, they, they grow fat and lazy off the land. They despise the one who gave it to them, and they turn to serve other gods. And that was provocation to God, stirring up His righteous anger and wrath. And that's what sin is, really. Sin is provocation. Uh, sometimes I think we forget that it is. We see it as a minor slip-up, and, you know, boys will be boys. God doesn't mind. Oh, God minds. Sin is rebellion, something we can't forget. So because of all this, God wanted this song to be memorized by Israel so they'd remember, verse 21, then it shall be when many evils and troubles have come upon them that this song will testify against them as a witness for it will not be forgotten in the mouths of their descendants. For I know the inclination of their behavior today even before I brought them to the land of which I swore to give them. Therefore Moses taught this song, excuse me, therefore Moses wrote this song the same day and taught it to the children of Israel. So again, the song serves as a testimony because it's written so long in advance because, you know, it's memorized so long in advance. Well, they can't claim that, you know, once they finally get their generations down the road, that it was just written in the moment to fit the circumstance. No, they would have known and had it taught to them from their grandparents and their grandparents before that. And they would have known, oh, this is exactly what God said. God had testified of our future apostasy. God knew what would happen. And God wanted Israel to know that God knew what would happen. Our God knows what's going to happen with us. He knows every detail about our lives about our past, about our present, and about our future. There is no act that we can take that is going to surprise God. He knows, and He wants us to know that He knows. That gives us even more reason to trust Him, doesn't it? That gives us even more reason to rely on His grace, because He already knows what we're going to go through. Verse 23, Then He inaugurated Joshua, the son of Nun, and said, Be strong and of good courage, for you shall bring the children of Israel to the land of which I swore to them, and I will be with you. Of course, this was commanded in verse 14. It's fulfilled in verse 23 here. God personally inaugurated or he commissioned Joshua, gives him the same promise that you know, Moses had early spoken to him. Of course, uh, Moses, that had been secondhand. Now he gets it firsthand. Of course, we have the firsthand promise of God for the same thing Jesus promised. Jesus, his own words, promised to be with his disciples to the end of the age. He never leaves us. But you've got to love on the fact here that on the heels of, of this prophecy predicting Israel's apostasy. It's the very next thing that happened. God affirms His promise to Joshua of His presence. God still gives Joshua the exhortation to be strong, to be courageous. Though God knew what was going to happen with the nation, already said all that, but well, didn't change God's promise provision for the nation. God promised to give them the land. God's going to do it. Praise God that His grace is based on His faithfulness and not ours. If we had to trust our own faithfulness to experience God's grace, we'd never get it. Thankfully, where we are faithless, he is faithful because God's good. Verse 24, so it was when Moses had completed writing the words of this law in a book, when they were finished, that Moses commanded the Levites who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, saying, take this book of the law and put it beside the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there as a witness against you. For I know your rebellion and your stiff neck. If today, while I'm yet alive with you, you have been rebellious against the Lord, how much more after my death? You know, this was already mentioned in verse 9, how he delivered the law to the priests. And verse 24 and following, it gives the details of that delivery. He does the, the writing. He, you know, gives it to the, the Levites. He commissions it as his witness against Israel. The law as a witness against Israel. Just like the, the song was a witness 
Well, Deuteronomy, the book itself, serves as a prophetic witness against the nation. It predicts in astonishing detail the future pro, uh, apostasy of Israel. No question that Israel would fall in this way. And Moses knew it. He had seen their grumblings and complaints for 40 years. He knew they'd continue the trend after his death. Verse 28, Gather to me all the elders of your tribes and your officers, that I may speak these words in their hearing and call heaven and earth to witness against them. For I know that after my death you will become utterly corrupt and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you, and evil will befall you in the latter days, because you will do evil on the side of the Lord to provoke him to anger through the work of your hands. So again, the future is clear. Israel is going to do evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking God to anger through their constant, corrupt, idolatrous practices and their apostasy. That's said all over again. But do you notice what's not said? What's not said is any change to the promise of God. Although God knew His own people would spurn Him and provoke Him to anger, after all these blessings He gave Him, God never once revoked the blessing that had been promised. What God said He would do, He would do. It was up to the people to rely on His grace for obedience. Again, our God is always faithful. What God promises, He fulfills, not because we're good, but because He's good. Now, verse 30, it just uh, that really goes with the, the song in chapter 32, how Moses spoke in the hearing of the assembly of Israel, the words of the song, and we'll get to that song next time. Israel had uh, been given godly leadership, but the future looked really bleak. Given this wonderful opportunity handed to them on a silver platter, but they'd waste it, they'd bring on the curses of the covenant. That wasn't what God desired for the nation, but it wasn't something he was surprised by either. He knew and he wanted Israel to know. The more they knew, the more opportunity they had to humble themselves in repentance and rely on God's grace. Admittedly, it's a sober note on which to end. But this is the reality faced by Israel in the future. Moses was not relying on human intuition when he's you know, predicting the failure of Israel. This is the sure prophecy of Almighty God. There's no doubt that the people would provoke him to wrath, there's no doubt of any of that. That was a truth. But God still gave them the opportunity to follow Him. He promised to take them into the land to provide victory over the enemies. Of course, He gave the law to give them the purpose of learning how to fear and obey Him. They'd fail. They were human. But God gave them the opportunity because God loved them. God gave them grace, and God wanted them to depend on His grace. We serve a gracious God. He knows everything about us. All of our sinful weaknesses, our failures, our shortcomings, He knows all of it. He knows the beginning from the end. He knows every single one of our future sins. He knows all the abhorrent things that even if we were told today, we would swear we would never do them, just like Peter swore he would never forsake the Lord. He would never deny the Lord, but he still did it. God knows all those things about us too. And guess what? On top of all those things, God still loves us. God still wants His best for us. And He still gives us the opportunity to succeed by walking daily with Jesus, walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. Even for wretched people like us, God still loves us as His own. Why? Because we've been bought by the blood of Jesus. God sees us through the redemption of His Son. That means he sees us through the lens of grace. Yes, we'll fail. God knows that we don't have permission to fail. Sin is still sin. But sin for the child of God is forgiven because of the sacrifice of the Son of God. Now we live in grace. Some today might need to remember the grace that we have been given in Jesus. Of course, for those who have our hope in Christ, we abide in the gospel. Well, we know Jesus never leaves us. He doesn't forsake us. He does not abandon those who believe on him for salvation. Others may need to remember that although our hearts are sinful, our strength is weak, God does call his people to fear and obey him. That we sin as Christians is not permission to sin as Christians. We are just as reliant on the Spirit to walk with him as we are to receive forgiveness from him. We need God's grace for everything. And thankfully, His grace is available abundantly through Jesus. And so we can go to Him in His name right now in prayer. Father, thank You for Jesus.
And thank you for the grace that he gives us. Thank you for the grace that he offers to all the world for any who would put their hope and their trust in him as the Son of God, crucified for sins, risen from the dead. Lord, you promise forgiveness to those who do. You promise adoption into your family. So, Lord, for those of us who have, oh, help us keep our eyes on Christ. Help us abide in Him. Help us every day be filled with the Spirit, be led by Your Word and by Your grace, that we would take advantage of the opportunities that You give us. We don't let them pass us by. Lord, that's Your desire for us. And though You know we will fail, You still love us. And you give us what we need when we do fail to pick us up and to clean us and declare again that we are yours. Lord, we love you. Fill us as we go forth from this space to give honor and praise your name. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.